All right, you guys ready to get this going? You know I am. Yeah, of course I am. Oh my, look who's back. Did your wife let you out of the house? Oh, come on. My wife put me on punishment last week. Just last week. Or for the last two weeks. <laughs> Taking orders from your wife. <laughs> You're scared of her. I'm not the least bit scared of my wife. Oh, yes. Hello, Lillian. What? Ah! <laughs> That wasn't very nice to do. Huh. Well, it just proves my point. Well, just because you're a confirmed bachelor, huh. having some woman tell you what to do, no thank you. I'm never going to take orders from a woman. I'm free! Coming, mother! Huh. Well, it looks like I'm doing this all by myself this week. <laughs> As a gamer 74 I'm your host Anthony Ventrillo and welcome to episode 16 Atari 2600 prototypes part 2 in the previous episode I discussed some of the uh, games that didn't quite make it to retail uh, for the Atari 2600 a lot of these games uh, were created and some of them finished but didn't quite get released uh, simply because of one reason or another. Mostly because of the video game crash of 83 and 84. Today we're going to look at some other games that uh, never got past the prototype stage. Many of them you probably have heard of and others you haven't heard of. And many of these games are great games and it's too bad that they didn't get released. So let's check them out. First game on today's list is called Cat Tracks. Cat Tracks was supposed to be re released in 1983 by a company called UA Limited. They actually made three games, none of which got released. Two of them will be on today's list. The original version of this game was a thought to be a Pac-Man clone that they were going to call Crazy Gobbler, but when Atari started to sue many game companies, they quickly changed the title to Cat Tracks. Okay, now you can see that it does have a lot of similar qualities to Pac-Man. A lot of people describe it as a mix between Pac-Man and Mousetrap, which you can kind of, I can understand that. Now what you are is you're a cat trying to eat a catnip and the dogs are coming after you and occasionally you can grab that potion and turn into the dog catcher and when you catch the dogs you send them back to the dog house, which gives you an opportunity to catch more of the catnip. Pretty fun game. Uh, the controls are not as fluid. Oh, you see, they just got me. Um, and the constant noise in the background sort of can get to you after a while. But overall, it's a pretty fun game. Not completely original, but yet I would say it's a whole lot of fun and one that you'll play over and over again, even if you do decide to turn the sound off. Next up, we have Rocky and Bullwinkle that was to be released by Mattel in 1983. It was programmed by Steve Crandall and Patricia Lewis DeLong. Now, in the 80s, there was a big resurrection of classic cartoons like Rocky and Bullwinkle, Underdog, uh, Tennessee Tuxedo, and a bunch of them. So it made sense that a game was to be made about this cartoon series. Okay, now, uh, according to the catalog entry, which I have in front of me from AtariProtos.com, Rocky and Bullwinkle must stop the evil Boris and Natasha from robbing a train full of priceless valuables. While Boris uses upsidaisism to float the valuables up to Natasha's waiting helicopter, Rocky must fly around and intercept them. When Rocky catches the valuables, he gives them to Bullwinkle for safekeeping. Now, this is a lot of fun to do this game. Uh, you can fly around as Rocky, and uh, occasionally Bullwinkle will drop that little brown thing there, and when you catch that, you can carry up to six items at a time. Now, if you catch the specific items that you see next to the timer, you can actually 
uh, put more time on the clock. You only have 75 seconds to complete all these tasks. I think it's too bad that this game wasn't released because it's a whole lot of fun, but it is readily available in ROM format all over the internet, so download it and give it a try for yourselves. Alright, next up we have Save Mary. This game was supposed to get released in 1990 by Atari and was programmed by a gentleman named Todd Fry who went by the name Axlon. I would have to say out of all the games on this list, this has to be probably the most original game, you know, out there. Honestly, it's really too bad this day game did not get released because I had a lot of fun playing it. Uh, is she gone? Is who gone? Oh! Hey, there you are. Is she gone? Uh, Lily was never here. Humphrey was just messing with you. Oh, what a jerk. Don't tell me you snuck out of the house again. No, I didn't sneak out of the house. Um, I told her I was going to go get a carton of milk. Uh, anyway, the game is about where you're trying to save this girl named Mary. Uh, apparently, Mary fell in a canyon and uh, it's filling up with water and you use a crane and you have these odd shaped blocks that you have to build a platform for her to climb up and to get out. Um, of course it gets more difficult because you got to be very careful and not squish her with the blocks and in later levels the blocks you know are different shaped and sometimes it's really hard to drop them right at the right spot. Uh, so uh, you got to be careful about that. And also, but most importantly, watch out and don't squish her. But at the same time, you got to work kind of quickly so you can get her out of the canyon. And occasionally you have some power-ups that uh, help you out. You have a plug that stops the water from rising for a few seconds. A stop sign makes Mary stop hopping around. Uh, oil can makes your crane move faster. A gold block makes Mary invincible to being squished by falling blocks. The number gives you bonus points, and a Mary figure gives you extra lives. Uh, one of the problems though, with this whole thing is that, again, Mary is runs around. Uh, it seems like the higher the water gets, the more she runs around going crazy. But, I mean, if you think about it, you know, you would probably do the same thing in her situation. And the power-ups only pop out every now and then, and, and for only a short amount of time. So you got to be really quick on the draw. Totally original. I mean, I have never seen a game before or since that just was so original that nobody else had ever thought of before. Yeah, I really like this game. It's a lot of fun, and like you said, it, it takes you a while to get the hang of it, especially in the later levels. You know, it's kind of funny, though. It makes me think about, like, if my wife was stuck in a canyon, I would probably have to save her because if I didn't, she'd probably come back and haunt me. Yeah, or she'd find a way to get out of the canyon anyway and then beat you up. Yeah, you got a point there. So anyway, um, readily available all over the internet. And uh, you can download the ROM and try it yourself. It's just a shame it didn't get released, but uh, around 1990 is when Atari pretty much ceased all operations. So unfortunately, uh, the game itself was uh, a victim of that. But yet, a very fun game. Find it somewhere on the internet, usually at Atari, uh, AtariAge.com, and give it a try, and you'll probably become addicted just like we were. Alright, next up we have Venetian Blinds by Activision. Wait, that, that was actually a game? Not exactly, but it does have an interesting story behind it. Actually, the full title of, the, of it is Venetian Blinds Demo. Anyway, on with the story. Uh, the story behind Venetian Blinds demo is rather interesting. As m most people know, Activision was founded by several ex-Atari employees who had left due to Atari's policies on programmer recognition. This had really struck a nerve since they were responsible for over half of Atari game sales at the time. One of these employees was Bob Whitehead, creator of the Venetian Blinds technique, which was first used in Atari's video chess to display eight objects in a row instead of the normal six. Even though Activision had never used the Venetian Blinds technique in any of their games up to this point, that didn't stop Atari from threatening to sue Activision for stealing the technique along with other various bits of proprietary information. 
Atari knew they probably couldn't win the lawsuit given that Activision wasn't even using the technique in question, but what they were hoping for was that they could either scare Activision into getting out of the game business or scare away people from doing business with them. Now, of course, the lawsuit pretty much went nowhere, and they came to some sort of agreement, and the rest is history. However, the bad side from this was that a bunch of third-party companies did pop up, and a bunch of crappy games came out, which led to the video game crash of 83 and 84. Now, I'm about to show you the demo. As you can see, uh, it's pretty neat. You can use the joystick to raise and lower the blinds by pushing it up or down. And you get to see out the window. It's pretty cool for its time, actually. All right, so let's check it out. Now, we have a nice window with some shades. And we're going to raise up the shades. And look at that beautiful sunset. Hey, that looks kind of familiar. Well, yeah, they use that sunset in several Activision games like Barnstorming and Stampede. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, I mean, it looks very realistic. Way ahead. Activision was always way ahead of their time. All right, let's close the shade and let's get started on the next game. All right, speaking of Activision, next up we have Hardhead. Uh, this game was supposed to be released in 1983. We don't know who the programmer is, but the cartridge was actually found in a salvage yard in 1998. And for many years, we didn't even know what the name of the game was because the uh, the label had long since fallen off. But in 2017, another copy of the game was found in the UK. And so now we know what the name of the game was. It's hard to imagine this game not being released as Activision themselves pretty much, I think, released just about every game they started and released games even after the crash. But... Um, as I said, there's not much information really known about this game other than the name. Uh, so hopefully as time goes on, we'll find out who the programmer was and maybe why it wasn't released. Alright, in this game you are this cute little alien guy down at the bottom and you are trying to uh, knock these blocks with your head to try to build a ladder to get out of to get out from underneath this conveyor belt. Really original game and it's a lot of fun, but boy it gets frustrating really quick because it's almost sometimes impossible to knock those bricks right in the right spot and then the conveyor belt goes the opposite direction and it, yeah, it's it's a lot of fun, but boy it takes a lot of practice to get this right and then sometimes you can get squished by the blocks or you know get squished by the uh, conveyor belt, but like I said, it's a whole lot of fun and pure strategy. Um, in later levels, it gets really, really difficult, but like I said, it's something you would kind of expect from Activision. I mean, you know, the quality of the game, while simplistic, is just really, you use your brain a lot in this game, and I would honestly have to say, this has to be a real, truly lost jewel, and one that you would really expect from Activision. Very original, a lot of fun, really uses higher order thinking skills and strategy, Head over to AtariAge.com and download the ROM. And again, I want to thank AtariProtos.com for informing me and everyone else about this game. All right, next up we have Grover's Music Maker uh, that was supposed to be released by Atari in 1983. And it was the only game out of the Muppet series and Sesame Street series that was not released. And it was to be used with the ill-fated Atari's Kids Controller. Here's what the kids controller looked like for those of you that had never seen one before. I personally didn't even know it existed until recently. And all the games that were made to be used with this were all learning games. Uh, you had Alpha Beam with Ernie, Big Bird's Ed Catch, Cookie Monster Munch, and uh, Oscar's Trash Race. There were several other games that were planned along with Grover's Music Maker like Holy Moly. Monster Size and Peekaboo that also didn't get released. Here's an advertisement for the game along with the game that did actually get released, Big Bird's Egg Catch. So let's check this game out and see, you know, what kids may have missed out on. All right, now in this game, you control the music by uh, using some of the buttons. Uh, you have uh, 20 different songs that you can play, and Grover will dance around. 
unfortunately it only goes through to letters A through T because again the game wasn't quite finished so there aren't 26 songs but with that you know the kids could play name that tune uh, and some of the songs are very well known like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star and Itsy Bitsy Spider but then they have some that I personally have never heard of and then you can also uh, make different beats and watch uh, Grover dance around to it uh, this was looked like this game was a lot of fun and I actually have to admit I had fun playing it but you know I loved Grover and Sesame Street as a kid so um, uh, I'm definitely one to check out and of course the ROM is readily available on AtariAge.com so download it and go back on memory lane and remember how great it was as a kid to watch Sesame Street Alright, and our final game for today is Funky Fish. It was uh, supposed to be released in 1983 by UA Limited. It was actually a port of a 1981 arcade game. Alright, Larry, take it away. Alright, in uh, this game, uh, you're a funky fish trying to destroy these evil uh, boss monsters, and they have fish surrounding them. You blast them with your bubble blaster, and then they will sink to the bottom and turn into fruit and you have to grab the fruit before they turn back into fish. It's a lot of fun and a really interesting game, very original. And we both had a lot of fun playing it and I'm sure you guys will too. So uh, head over to AtariAge.com and download the game and have at it. Alright, well that brings us to the end of today's episode. If you enjoyed it, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe if you haven't already. And again, I want to thank each and every one of you that have viewed our videos, liked them, and subscribed. It really means a lot to us, and I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking uh, some time out of your busy day to check out our episodes. I want to thank our friends at AtariProtos.com and of course AtariAge.com where you can find anything and everything Atari related. Don't forget to head over to our Facebook page at the uh, link you see down there at the bottom where you can find bonus footage from today's episode and past episodes and lots of cool artwork and of cartridges and boxes and other cool stuff. If you have any suggestions of games you'd like to see in future episodes, please don't hesitate to let us know in the comments section below. Well, this has been Anthony Ventrillo and Larry, Larry the Lion, and we will see you all in the next episode. Until then, have a blessed day. Goodbye.